Greetings. I am Dr. Graciela Caneiro Livingston, Provost at Nebraska Wesleyan University. I want to welcome you to this year's presentation of Spooky Evenings. We here at Nebraska Wesleyan are excited and proud of this event that brings together scholars, artists, authors, and filmmakers to discuss the topic of horror in its various manifestations across the arts and the humanities. Professor Juan Jose Castaño Marquez and Dr. Matthew Jarvis have been working tirelessly to bring you the best scholarship in the field of horror through this unparalleled digital humanities event. I would like to acknowledge the generous support from the Nebraska Arts Council, Humanities Nebraska, and the Nebraska Cultural Endowment that helps make quality programming like spooky evenings possible. Again, welcome and enjoy this presentation of Spooky Evenings. Tonight on Spooky Evenings, Richard Chismar, the author of the New York Times bestselling book, Chasing the Boogeyman. Thank you all for joining us for the premiere of season two of Spooky Evenings. And uh, thank you to my guest, Richard Chismar. Richard, welcome. Thank you. Thanks for asking me. Uh, my, my pleasure. Um, as I told you before we went live, I want to kind of begin this with uh, questions that maybe you haven't been asked. And mm -hmm. to, to do that, I think I'm going to hop into my way back machine here and tell you how I became aware of you without knowing who you are. Okay. Uh, I became aware of you through the Masters of Horror series. Oh, wow. And I became aware of you because I know what the Washingtonians is. Right. That's funny. Yeah, uh, I, for a second, I thought you were going to say, I, I became aware of you from Roadhouse 2. Oh, wow. Well, I, I was going to say, this is going to be an interesting night. But yeah, no, we had a blast with the Washingtonians. Um, such a good short story from Bentley Little. And uh, and my my writing partner, John Sheck, and I were just thrilled when we got the go ahead to, to do it for Masters of Horror. Um, you know, we... Uh, we had a blast with the script and then because of budget cuts, they couldn't film at all. But yeah, we had it. We had a great time. Uh, awesome. For those of you unfamiliar, uh, the Washingtonians um, basic plot is that the founding fathers were cannibals <laughs> and yeah. uh, participated in cannibalistic rituals that uh, I think, you know, sort of you think about it today, because I've been talking a lot about uh, contemporary satanic panics today uh, in relationship to cannibalism. And it's sort of like interesting because you you sort of like were the precursor to that in some ways and that the, the government was filled with cannibals. Yeah. Yeah. Ben, Bentley uh, has the most bizarre imagination. I mean, he he will his stories i mean he's written stories about a haunted potato a pillow an evil pillow just the most bizarre things you can think of he's done um you know like an evil phone book i think once so so yeah when we read this story i'm like this is this is a story that only bentley could write and uh it was actually pretty clever and and, a, and you know a, a bit of a of a you know black comedy too but uh yeah we we just like i said we had a great time and, and the the fact that peter medic who uh, has directed so many great films, including The Changeling, um, you know, was was signed on to direct. That was that was, you know, kind of the cherry on top for us. Um, sorry, haunted phone book just is now stuck in my head. <laughs> I know, right? 
Yeah, I think it, should, I, I, he has a collection called The Collection, by the way, um, that is just stuffed. I, I think there's like 35 or 40 stories in there. And The Washingtonians is one of them. Um, right. Yeah, it, it's it's one of the best you know short story collections in the genre I've ever read. But And I'm actually looking over the top of my laptop screen here and I can see from the episode of The Washingtonians, I can see the, uh, the eyeball um, and the uh, finger. Um, that were that were in. You know, I'm not giving too much away here. That were in the cereal bowl when uh, when the main character was having his breakfast one morning, and uh, he discovered them in his cereal. I forgot that I got to take those with me. I I, I think the Washingtonians is a fair game for spoilers at this point. Yeah, yeah, it's been out long enough. A, a, a little a little bit. Um, that series was rather interesting. The entire Masters of Horror uh, series and. Um, that kind of anthology, you you wonder why. Um, you wonder why more of that isn't present today. Uh, you see it somewhat in film, but not so much uh, in like a serialization on television anymore. Though I guess American story, uh, I can speak American <laughs> Horror Story this year. Uh, kind of tried to pick that up again. Yeah, I mean, there's the new Creep Show, and there there are a handful of anthology shows, but Masters of Horror was so you know high profile. It was on uh, what Showtime, I, I believe, and yes. uh, you know it it, uh, it ran for two seasons. And yeah, we were fortunate to uh, to be able to do that. We wrote two more episodes for Mick Garris for a series called. Uh, and now, of course, I'm going to forget it. But if I look, I can find the DVDs. Fear itself. <laughs> it's called Fear itself, and we. Uh, we, we wrote two episodes of that, and, but that only lasted one year. And I think that was like CBS or something, but uh, yeah, that, those were good times. I, I'm, I'm, I'm actually happy to hear that you found out about me from Washingtonians. I, I did. <laughs> that was a good time. Like I said, we, you know, we, uh, it was actually, you know, you write a lot of scripts and you're not always proud of, of how they finish up because, you know, so much of film work is by committee. And, and that one, that was one where between working with Mick Garris and the producers and Peter Maddock, we were really happy with how it turned out. Um, and, and then, you know, you got to set and we're like, well, we can't have, you know, we had this very eerie uh, hide and seek type scene with the lanterns, you know, where they were searching for him in the woods and we had to cut that. And then there was a great car chase, which we probably should have been smart enough to not put in there in the first place, but it was in the story. So we really liked it and we put it in the script, but they kept, they kept a lot of the fun stuff. Okay. Um, in terms of uh, this process, I've talked to a lot of authors over the summer, and uh, I have heard about not just the committee process, as you put it, in terms of uh, getting it from uh, greenlit to finish, but also just getting it to greenlit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I'm mutual. Uh, I, I, um, a mutual horror person in this uh, that we, we share is Almakatsu. Hmm. Uh, and she was talking about this in relationship to the hunger. Uh, and just getting that from, you know, bought to greenlit and made. Has... She's wonderful. Yeah, she's she's a wonderful writer. Um, yeah, a lot of frustration, which is why I now, you know, um, I, I tell my agents, um, you know, yeah, yeah, you know, sell it, absolutely option it. No, I don't want to write it. No, I don't want to... <laughs> You know, be on board as this or that. Just, uh, you know, find talent, good, talented people who want to make it and uh, they can cut a check and they can do their thing. You know, I had fun, but I I, I got into the film business kind of by accident. I, I, I grew up with a guy named Jonathan Sheck um, who went out to Hollywood, uh, he quit college and, and he went out there and he became a model and then an actor. And he ended up doing a lot of big films and for a time there, he was like the next big hot, you know, actor. Uh, he was on the front of Vanity Fair with like Will Smith and Johnny Depp and those guys. Um, and he had a great career and he's still he's still out there cooking, you know, still doing his thing. Um, but, you know, once you're not 25 and, and handsome, once you're 45 and 50 and handsome, you get different kind of projects. So but we, we ran into each other one day back at home when he was visiting his parents here in Maryland. And uh, we just started talking and we're like, you know what, we should do something together. So. I sent him a copy of uh, my latest collection. He found a story called Heroes that he really loved. And he's like, let's make a short film from this. And um, 
next thing I know, I'm in L.A. for the first time, you know, on a set in the middle of the night. There's Jaiman Hansu, who was uh, he was the lead in, in the Gladi- Gladiator with Russell Crowe and Amistad and just a great actor. Great guy, too. And he, he played the lead in our little short film and um, showed it to a bunch of festivals. And that got us some writing jobs. And we started. Um, you know, writing out there in in Los Angeles and had four or five things produced. And I had a great time, you know, came close to to making a a couple Stephen King films, which would have been, you know, a dream. Um, But after, you know, after five or six years, I just got, you know, even, and we were fortunate because we were having things actually produced. Um, I feel, you know, bad for the guys who get put through the ringer and never see, you know, anything on screen. Um, But honestly, after five, six, seven years, I was just like, John, this is exhausting. You know, I'd rather go back to, you know, just being a fiction writer and publishing the magazine and books. So, you know, we're still tinkering. We're still doing things. But for the most part, I've kind of left that behind just because, you know, almost probably she told you the story. You know, it's frustrating and it can can just drive you batty. So with the magazine, I, that's been your sort of like labor of love since uh, college or even before college? College. My senior year is when it started in 1988. Um, you know, I was selling short stories to, to various like small press, very small press markets, the kind that pay like a half a cent a word. Um, and I was, you know, I'd get my contributor copies and I'd be all excited to open the envelope and I'd pull them out. And, you know, about 50 percent of them were 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 nice nicely produced and, and were something that I was proud to show my, my family, my friends. And then the other 50% were just pretty dreadful, you know, um, just really poor production values. And that, that, that's what made my brain start thinking, maybe I should do something myself. Um, and then I, there was a magazine called the horror show published by uh, David Silva out in California. And I found out that he was a one man show and that kind of inspired me to do it. And, uh, you know, I always say I was young enough and dumb enough to uh, to believe I could do it and just jumped in with both feet and never looked back. So uh, in terms of the challenges there, I mean, I know you've talked in other interviews about the um, like the first uh, sort of autobiographical chapter of Chasing the Boogeyman mm-hmm. is about 95 percent accurate to your life. Oh, yeah. Um, but you don't get uh, too much in the weeds uh, where I want to get to with you. Uh in terms of the struggle uh, implied, or was it not? I mean, because you, you allude to it, you talk about moving back in with your parents. um, And yeah, I mean that it was a struggle with a big, you know, in all capital letters. Um, It's interesting that you asked that because that's, that's what connected John Chuck and I together. He, at the time that I ran into him, he was kind of on the top of the world. And I, and I remember when we met, he was jogging and I pulled over to talk to him and I said, I, you know, I congratulated him. I said, but that's not what I want to know about. I want to know about the, the struggle because I said, I know in any creative endeavor like this, you, for every yes, you're getting 10 no's, you know? And I said, because I'm going through the same thing. And that's, that's kind of what bonded us from, from that day. Cause we hadn't seen each other in, you know, probably five or six, seven years after, you know, before that. Um, so I love that you asked that because I, yeah, I have, uh, I have a lot of stories. I, I moved home with my parents, not because of that struggle, actually, but because I was going to be married. I, I was engaged and I was going to be married at nine months. So we're just like, you know what, D- don't go out and get an apartment until we're together. Um, you know, kind of old fashioned that way. And we said, we'll, we'll save some money. So you go ahead and live at home and she's living at school. And um, so that was the reasoning for that. But, oh, you know, once we were married and, and, you know, digging into the, those first few years of the business. Yeah. It, it, it was, it was a struggle. It was, uh, um, yeah. I mean, like I said, I, you know, I got through on passion for, for what I was doing and, and loving what I was doing. Cause there was a lot of 15, 16, 17 hour days, uh, seven days a week. I didn't go on vacation for probably my poor, my poor wife. We didn't go on vacation for probably 10, 12, 15 years anywhere. Um, <laughs> Yeah. You know, we would uh, cause for celebration is when we would get an overseas order and instead of a money order, it was cash. And we would take like the 60 bucks out of the envelope and and head over to, uh, you know, like Applebee's or something and then go to the mall and get an ice cream. And that was a big night for us. So, I mean, I think that's important for people to hear as well in terms of being an author, because I feel like a mystique kind of builds up around people. Mm. Um, particularly when they start, when the snowball starts like accumulating. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I mean, congratulations on, on the Thank success you. of Chasing the Boogeyman. Mm-hmm. But I know that behind 
each of that there's there's there is a lot of struggle and i think a lot of people miss that connection yeah no right? it's one of the i think nowadays with it, it you know we're in a society where it's you know people want that immediate you know kind of satisfaction much more than than back you know in the in the late 1980s and and also you have you know so so many so much different technology at your fingertips um, you know, back then it was, I was on a little Apple computer learning how to, you know, design what was, you know, a pretty dreadful looking first couple issues, um, on, uh, you know, on this cheap desktop publishing software, dreaming of the day I could afford an Apple laser printer. Um, I was mm-hmm. sneaking into the college to use their laser printer. Um, and yeah, just everything was, was kind of done by the seat of the pants and, um, yeah, I, I, I'm always really upfront with people when I tell the story because I, I you know, I want them to understand that. Yeah, I'm like the, the worst time of the year for me was tax time because I would fill out, I would figure out my finances and I'd be like, I would look at Kara, my wife, and I'd be like, I'm, I, I made like 13 cents an hour last year because you know, there's so many hours uh, of, uh, of the grind of work. And, you know, in the beginning, you're not pulling in you know very many uh, dollars so like you said the magazine has always been a labor of love it's always been something that even at its height of success the magazine business is such a just poorly run business that you know financially it doesn't make sense i've had many people tell me that um just put that money into books you know you you know the profit margin is so much better and i've always just you know had a had a problem giving that up because nostalgic reason sentimental but also because it's kind of always kind of been the the backbone of of the business and and i like seeing it so we need to get back on schedule with that because it always makes me happy to see a new issue do you view that as your sort of um pay it forward in a way like your your ability to help out the younger version of you from 1988 in 2021 yeah, I mean, I'll help anyone who, who you know, I know is serious and, and has integrity um, and is sincere about their love for the, for the genre, just f- for what you said, paying it forward, because, I, you know, I mentioned the guy's name, David Silva. Um, he, he put up with a lot of phone calls from me. Um, it's something I learned, you know, early on is, 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 you know, it's a lot more important to listen than it is to talk. So I asked a lot of questions. I paid attention um, to, you know, anyone whose work I respected, you know, I paid attention to what they had to say. And that was the cool thing about the genre is there was a lot of people willing to, you know, once they saw that the passion was genuine, they were really willing to, to lend their talents and, uh, their advice. And so, yeah, I, I, I look back all the time and, and, and I'm, you know, I, I wake up every day grateful for where I am and kind of, you know, for what the journey was like. Do you feel that, uh, you talked about sort of like um, the technological change, uh, and especially sort of the uh, the globalization of publishing, as it were, through like you know, anybody can publish anything on the internet, really. Right. Um, do you find that that makes it uh, a, a greater challenge today to have, to find sort of like the hidden gems uh, as opposed to in the late eighties? Probably, it's just like self published books. You know, it's harder to wade through it all to 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 find the quality. Um, you know, I had a very nice lady who, who I I had a long phone conversation with probably two or three weeks ago. And uh, she said, well, you know, how would you approach, you know, starting a publication or a, or a, a, a publishing company now? And I'm like, it is so different than when I started. Um, you know, some of the basics would still exist, you know, and that is simply, you know, recognize from day one that you're going to have to work really, really hard, that there are no shortcuts, um, and I, I said, number two, you know, I always looked at it as, and it's, it's how I've, it's how I've, you know, um, kind of undertaken the promoting of chasing the boogeyman um, is, is, is that is like no avenue, you know, no venue is too small. There's no corner that is too, you know, that should be kind of too dusty or cobwebby to explore because uh, you just never know where, you know, things will lead. And that's how I started the business. I was willing to kind of, you know, work anywhere. Anywhere they'd give me, a, you know, an audience or a stage, I was like, you know, willing to peddle the magazine. Um, and then the other advice I gave her that still, I think, applies nowadays is I said, you know, you have a lot of people. You, I always say, make sure you're giving because they're not going to buy it. So make sure you're giving copies of your publication to the people you want to work with in the future. Because, you know, when I started Stephen King and Peter Straub and Ray Bradbury and Dean Koontz and Clyde Barker, they weren't going to buy Cemetery Dance. They weren't going to 
send me a check and subscribe. So for those first few years, I had a list of probably 100, 120, you know, writers, artists, um, designers, producers, um, directors who I sent a copy of the magazine free, you know, every time. And, uh, and I ended up working with a bunch of them as, as, as time passed. Um, and that's what I say. I have so many people tell me, well, I can't afford to do that. And I always come back and say, you can't afford not to, right. because that, that's, that's where you want to be. And you have to figure out a way to make that work. So, but, you know, that's kind of a long winded way of saying that if, if I think today's technology makes, you know, it's, it's a pretty pat answer, I guess it, it makes a lot of things easy, but yeah, I mean, the internet, I, I can't even fathom, you know, there was no internet. There was no email when I started. And I, I that's why I tell people, I spent my twenties sitting at a coffee table folding flyers, shoving them in envelopes, sealing the envelopes, putting on stamps and labels, because that's how we marketed. It was direct mail. Mm -hmm. um, display advertising in some cases, you know, I got lucky and I had an ad in the last issue of Twilight Zone magazine. Okay. That, that sat on newsstands for months because there was no new issue to push it off. So that was, that was gold. Um, <laughs> but there weren't a lot of magazines to advertise in. I couldn't afford like Omni, you know, or right. some of those. Or, so, uh... yeah. Famous monsters of Hollywood land. Right. <laughs> yeah. So it was, it was, man, it was all direct mailing. It was buying mailing lists from books, from book dealers, mail order book dealers, from other magazines. Um, the Stephen King book club that was in Pennsylvania all those years, the Stephen King library was called. Um, you know, I got a hold of, of, of a nice, of a big chunk of their mailing list. And uh, it took me months to go through because it was so many names, mm -hmm. but all those things, you know, and, and then you would throw 3000 flyers in the mail and just pray that your PO box would, would be full. Cause if it wasn't, you had to figure out how the hell am I going to do the next direct mailing? <laughs> so yeah, it's, it wasn't very glamorous. It's, it's all nuts and bolts stuff, but you know, like I said, I genuinely love this stuff. For, so f to, despite the frustrations, it was like, I was just, you know, ready to wake up the next morning and go at it again. Most of the time. So uh, you posted a video today um, in, in conjunction with Chasing the Boogeyman from the Myers house. Right. Uh, congratulations on the um, ability to have a truthful place called the Myers house right. in relationship to Halloween and your story. Uh, How cool is that? Right. I mean, you, you, sometimes the, uh, the the truth is better than fiction in some ways. Mm -hmm. um, which, which is also part of what your book gets toward. Um yeah. It, it's funny too. Uh, the the other book I've encountered this year was the fortunateness of uh, Voorhees Street in Manhattan working mm. out very well in uh, in Goldie Madovsky's book. <laughs> um, so there there are those moments, right, that, that works very right. well. But you actually revisited that site recently. I did. Um, and it's interesting to me because I mean, you mentioned your collaborations with Stephen King. But what I was thinking more than your collaborations with Stephen King is you kind of had a Stephen King childhood at the almost right time to be having a Stephen King childhood. I did. Like you could have been a character. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's one of the reasons why I connected so well with his books at an early age, because I felt like, wow. And I think it's why so many people do. I, I, I think, uh, you know, and I can't speak for the people who grew up in like our urban settings, but I know. I know, for instance, a lot of the people that I've talked to over the years about this, they're like, well, I, I either felt like I lived in a Stephen King novel or I wanted to mm. um, or I knew someone who did. And, and that's kind of how I felt with, you know, the, that connection was there. I was like, man, he, he's writing about my neighbors and stuff, because I, I've always said and, and I've said this a lot lately that I always feel like in small towns, the kids and this is something that Steve was just dead, you know, on target about the kids are the ones who kind of know the heartbeat of the town. You know, um, maybe the sheriff's got a nice finger on the pulse and the milkman when the, you know, when, when we still had those guys, but it's the kids who know the shortcuts and the, and the little hiding spots. And it's the kids who are seeing through windows, you know, when they're taking shortcuts through to the neighborhood and, and they kind of know, I always said, you know, they know what's what you put out at the curb with your trash. They know the guy who's, whose trash can is clinking because it's full of liquor bottles every week. And they know which parents hit their kids and, and all those things. Um, so, yeah, in that way, I felt very attuned with that. Like I was, you know, almost like you said, growing up in that Stephen King, uh, you know, scenario. But uh, yeah. And, and, and like I said, I've heard that from a lot of people. They're just like, you know, I either felt like and the same thing with Chasing the Boogeyman. I, when I originally 
uh, turned it in, I remember thinking, this might be too personal and too small of a story because it's so, obviously it's so me. And, and I don't know if it'll connect with readers. And then that's kind of been the cool surprise afterwards. And I, and I kind of want to smack myself in the head and say, Hey, dummy, you should have known better. You know, it, it's kind of egotistical think I'm just telling my story. It's a shared story for so many people. So many no, people, I mean, I, I, I grew up in a very small town too, that actually had uh, a, a suspicious murder during my, my, uh, it's like right. um, 12 to 14 years, uh, oh. the Tessa Van Hart murder. There's a book. Uh, yeah. Um, but no, I, I kept thinking about that growing up because we used to go like on these trails behind my grandparents' house and things. And, uh, well, that's, and that's it. Every, every small town has the famous crime or murder and the haunted house and the trails behind you, the houses and all that. And, so, yeah, I mean, I, I could, you know, you could probably write down that story and I'd be like, yep, I did half that stuff. So, I mean, in terms of returning, then you said you live uh, pretty close to where you grew up still. Um, how is that for you in terms of like, the, the returning to these places now that you've also written it down and you've put in, you've put a chunk of yourself in a way out into the world? Do you view it even more differently? Is there a sense of detachment in that regard? Um. Today was strange. I mean, you know, you referenced the video I posted today and what I'm doing is I'm posting a daily video for the month of October for this, this big promotion I'm doing. And, and today was really strange um, actually walking up the gravel driveway of the Myers house. And, and I, and I referenced it in the beginning of the video. I'm like, it's been, you know, 30, 35, 40 years since I've walked this way. And I've walked this path, you know, hundreds of times as a, as a teenager and a young, as a young man, but uh, it's been that long. So today felt very surreal walking up there with my son, um, you know, not to be too dramatic or, or to sound like, <laughs> like the narrator of chasing the boogeyman, but it's almost like you could feel those ghosts and see. How could you not that. sound like the narrator of chasing the boogeyman? Yeah, yeah that's true. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm excused. But uh, yeah, you, I can almost, you know, feel and, and see and sense those ghosts of us playing football in that field and us walking up that field at, as dusk fell. And uh, like I said, it was it was where I probably told my very first scary stories out loud to my friends. And I can't tell you how many times we just took off running and, you know, screaming. And then, like I said, then we'd break up laughing and but we were terrified. And then the next day we'd do it again and they'd be begging me, don't don't do it again, please just stop. And uh, of course I couldn't help it. What were those stories? Oh man. Usually, usually probably pretty uh, sophomoric monster stories. Cause, Cause it's like I said, they usually culminated with me looking over my shoulder and being, but I know I told like hook type legend stories mm. and, and you know, the, I, I saw on the news earlier today that someone escaped from, from the, uh, you know, from the sheriff's office in, in, in Edgewood and, and they're still looking for them and you know, those things. And, and the thing is, is it's just, you know, when you're 12 or 13, the kids are smart enough to know not to believe you, but it's dark out. And there's the outline of this big hulking house, you know, up, up ahead in the foreground or, or, or I say, I see, I see, you know, I saw something moving up there and then, you know, you can't help, but just buy into it. I mean, I, I was scared too half the time. So I was convincing myself. Um, but again, we, we, you know, cl close knit group of guys that I'm still fortunate to be in touch with. And, that would be really surreal. You know, you give me three or four of my childhood friends and we all walk up that driveway at night. It, it would be interesting. I feel like that's got to be one of these videos now. Yeah. Well, one of them lives in West Virginia. The other one's in South Carolina. So I need to get them back here. A couple of them still live here in Maryland, not far from me. So they would be easy. But the, the two main guys that I grew up with on Hanson Road are, are the ones who live out of state. So if I could get them back, I'm in. Hopefully without stabbing each other. Oh God. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. I just, uh, you know, I, and maybe like um, a montage sequence with uh, the boys are back in town or something. Uh, yeah. Flying, yeah flying my son, my son could edit the heck out of that. <laughs> he could, uh, he could do something fun. Um, I, I think that would be quite good. I, I think you, you got to make it happen now. <laughs> well, I'm shocked at the response already to the video I put. So many people, it made them happy that, you know, they're like, oh, my God, I said, you know, I got a, a visual of Edgewood. And that's been the response from from all the locals for the book, which is, again, it kind of I just never really thought about it ahead of time. You know, right before the book came out, I remember thinking, 
I hope I did Edgewood and, and the town people, you know, I hope I did them justice. Um, I hope I treated them with the proper respect. And, 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 and as soon as I started seeing the reviews that said, this is kind of a love letter to the author's hometown. I was like, okay, good. Because, you know, that I, I wanted that, you know, th- these are very positive uh, memories on my part. Um, but uh, yeah, it would, uh, it would be interesting to, to, to have us all together and seeing it through modern day eyes. You know. It's also this interesting thing too. I mean, apart from the type of uh, sort of like monster story, let's say that the book is, and I think that's fair to say without giving oh, yeah. anything away. Um, it's also, as you've kind of alluded to, a ghost story. Mm-hmm. Because I mean, that's how memory works, right? It, me- memory is, as you say, like these ghosts of your youth playing football and things that you pass by today as well. Um, and that does hang pretty heavily over the book as well. And it's, and it's, it's, and that was a very real feeling that I experienced as a 22 year old. Um, you know, I look back now and I think, you know, man, you were 22, man, you're a grown up, get out there and do your thing. You know, I, I understand, you know, you lived, you lived at home, but I'm like, you know, you were already kind. And then I think back and I'm like, no, you know, when you get out of college, you think, you know, everything, but you really don't. And especially when you're, you know, six, nine months away from getting married and, and you're, you know, I had a journalism degree from the University of Maryland, which was a wonderful school, a top ranked school. And I didn't even put together a resume. You know, I, I was like I said, I was young and dumb enough to think I'll, I'll make this work. And, and, and it did, but it took a decade to even begin to. Um, so, yeah, I, it was an interesting dynamic to be home. And, and that's kind of what the, I always hit that nail on the head. I'm like, not only am I back in my hometown, but I'm in the bedroom that I grew up in. You know, I'm looking out over the side yard where I played marbles and, and you know, played wiffle ball and, and you know, um, climb, you know, build a, a tree house in the Weeping Willow. So you, you talk about ghosts there. I'm surrounded by them, whether right. I want to be or not. And then when you're coming from a, this really ripe, creative place uh, where you feel like, OK, this is it. Now it's time to do the work. Um, I'm, I'm out of a classroom. Um, it was just a really interesting time because, and I remember thinking like, I, yeah, now I haven't crossed this bridge into adulthood yet. I'm, I'm like right smack in the middle of it and, uh, everything's coming at me really fast now. Um, so for me, you're right. I mean, it, it is about a lot of, you know, in a way it's about those ghosts because I think the book is as much about the past as it is the, the present and the future. And, uh, for me, you know, I've always been uh, a big fan of that. You know, I, I like learning from the past and, and uh, you know, that nostalgic pool that's there. Yeah, I mean, that, it's interesting because I've read a lot of horror um, fiction in the last year. And that does seem to be more of where the genre is moving toward, too, this mm-hmm. reflection uh, on um, almost a point of authenticity from one's youth and then drawing it forward i read um the return for instance by kate reed petty um clay mcleod chapman's um whisper down the lane he's really good i'm a big fan of his uh he'll be on the 11th oh good well tell him i said hello when you get him on there uh, we're going to talk yeah. about carnage <laughs> oh <laughs> yeah um, man, he's a talented guy yeah, he, he actually was on this summer talking about Whisper Down the Lane, and we just spoiled the whole book. It was great. Uh, <laughs> I love that. I told him it should have been called um, A Pile of Possums, because it was my favorite phrase from the book, that if you hadn't read the book, you had no idea, and it was just out of nowhere, but I was like fixated on that phrase. Yeah. Um, you but, know, I, think uh, yeah. I think that's always been there. I mean, I, 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 you're right. And I think it's becoming more prevalent, but I, I'm thinking of books like Dan Simmons, the, the sequel to, to Summer of Night, when it was a winter haunting, which is all about looking back. And, you know, it's just interesting because that's one thing I've learned from working with, with Stephen King is he, he has a really good grasp on nostalgia and, and when to be sentimental and when not to. And I'll tell you, I loved, I love one of the best things about working with him hand in hand like that is seeing the choices that he makes. And, and there's a lot of times when good old Rich would have went right for the sappy, you know, sentimental feel there. And it, it's Steve who's got a big heart and obviously writes with a lot of that in his, in his fiction, he can be tough as nails. And there's times when you, you th- I, like I said, I think, you know, well, Rich would have, probably went for the cheap uh let's get them to get choked up while they're reading chapter seven in the doctor's office steve's just like nope 
you know, just plows ahead. So yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't say that you uh, dwell in nostalgia. I just, it, it's more atmospheric, I think. And what's interesting to me, if I juxtapose it to, you know, the, the Stephen King generation of authors, let, let's say, is that you've moved it forward, you know, to a degree into the 1980s. And that's, that's the era of nostalgia um, that I think is more prevalent today. Mm -hmm. I, I think you're losing that prevalence of nostalgia for the 1950s in relationship to societal horror. And right. Maybe true horror, which I mean, this is what the, the book is purporting to be as its premise. So again, I don't think I'm giving anything away. No. Um, I'm trying not to. Over the summer, I spoiled every book. And I'm no, not, not at all. Because we're, I mean, we're, we're live, I'm trying not to do that with this one. Uh, and um, with regard to this, though, it's interesting to see that move forward and that shift mm -hmm. forward. Because, I mean, you are a different generation. Right. Yourself. And so oh, your experience yeah. is obviously different. And it's interesting, though, because you still get the same sort of, like, as you put it earlier, this, this feel of the universality of perhaps... Um, I, I, this is going to be a horrible term of phrase to use because I can't come up with a better one though. But like an American horror story, it is a type of American horror story that has oh, yeah. this nostalgia of being a kid. Yeah, um, and predominantly East Coast, mm -hmm. um, of a certain socioeconomic group between sort of like lower and middle middle class. Yep, exactly. And then just the, sort of like the the challenges that are therein. Right. Yeah, it, it's interesting because you just, you, yeah, I mean, it's like you hit all the the major points of of my book of Boogeyman and a lot of others like that you just listed and, and others. But um, it, you know, someone asked me recently if if it was uh, if any of it was purposeful, you know, like audience targeting on my standpoint, and I was just like, no. I said that's that's the neat thing with this book is it. I wrote it. You know, writers talk all the time about. It. I just I wrote this book for myself, and mm -hmm. you know, I, I know. You know, because I'm friends with some of these guys, I'm, I'm, I'm like behind the camera going, no, you didn't. You told me all about it. <laughs> and then, you know, and then about the other half are, are, are absolutely le legit in telling the truth. But this is one of those instances where it's like I didn't even tell my agent what I was writing because I was afraid she would talk me out of it. Um, I just once I got into the story, I was just like, you know what? I just I want to tell the story. And it wasn't. You know, I don't think it was my subconscious working like, hey, I want to hang out with my parents for a few months. They've been, you know, they've been gone for for the last 10 or 15 years. Um, that ended up being like this wonderful bonus that I felt like, you know, they were with me again for, for the four months it took me to write the book and, and my friends. And um, it, it almost felt, yeah, like I said, it, it, it often felt a little self-indulgent because I was having such a great time writing it. Um, but, you know, I didn't have to audience target or any of that. It was just my, it was, you know, it was just how I, uh, how I grew up and, um, you know, the whole, you know, and again, we're not giving away the book, but, you know, I modeled it after a true crime book because that was, that's, you know, that, that came really early, like, you know, paragraph three, where it's just like, boom, you've been wanting to do this for a long time. This is a perfect book to do it, you know, and, you so know, this is the, uh, the phantom feeler. Phantom Fondler. Fondler, yeah. sorry. Yeah, it was no Phantom Feeler might have even been allowed because, you know, I hate to say it, but, you know, back then, anytime we heard Phantom Fondler, you, even though it was so horrible what the guy was doing, you couldn't help but smirk a little bit because, you know, how often you pick up your, you know, your, your county paper and on the front, you know, screaming headline, the Phantom Fondler strikes again. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, that's, you know, it changed the town and I remember feeling it. And it's, it's interesting because when I watched the movie Scream, however long ago that came out, I was like, that's kind of what it felt like. It, the town, you know, changed and there were whispers of a curfew and there were whispers of people buying guns and setting traps in their ha side of their houses. And, and I know, you know, there was people were buying, uh, you know, um, motion detector uh, spotlights for their houses and more deadbolts and the whole thing. So it changed our town. And, and I just, again, when I, when I was thinking about what do I want to write about my hometown, I wanted it to be more like it, you know, I wanted it to be this big global story that, that uh, kind of, you know, was, I was telling my version of it from the perspective of my small town. And instead it ended up being this very localized focused story. And, and that's why I was like, you know, maybe no one will read this, but my son, I've said this a bunch of times, but it's so true. My, my oldest son, who's a, a writer and a filmmaker and a, and a pretty 
you know, go, you know, uh, kind of, he's kind of, you know, he's got that gunslinger attitude where he's 22 and it's like, yeah, you know, you know, I'm bulletproof. He was the one worried. He's like, dad, you can't try to portray this as true. Cause you know, you're going to scare people in Edgewood and, and you're going to drive the property values down. And I'm like, Billy, this little campfire story that I'm writing, you know, maybe 50 people will read it. Who knows? You know? <laughs> so the fact that, it, it, you know, the fact that it ended up being read by a lot more than 50 people is kind of like, as much of a surprise to me as anybody I, I just, just a few more than 50 what are you, are you yeah. fifth printing is that where you're at now uh four but uh, hopefully we'll get to five in october but yeah so he likes to you know he's like i told you so because you know as soon as it sold to simon and schuster their their legal department yeah. squashed any chance of it being uh you know uh portrayed as a true crime book so What's well, interesting too, because you the, the way you started, obviously you had that little disclaimer at the beginning that it, it, it is not true. Um, Which I didn't write, by the way. I, okay. I, they made me. They made me put it in, and and I and I told them, I, and and it not nearly as bravely as it sounds. But I was essentially like, "That's fine, you know, you can write it." I, I was like, "I'm not writing that. I'm not putting a disclaimer. I don't even want to put a novel on the front of the cover." But uh, it's funny because yeah, it says right there a novel and then it says right there hey this is from this guy's warped imagination it's not true but it didn't matter well i mean it is interesting because right just when i when i started reading it even reading the forward right um by jenner it um it i i, I had to think is <laughs> is this just another character in this piece even uh in, in the way that it's conceptualized um because you do I mean, you package it you've got photographs in it and things the photos so, are what I think because a lot of people have said, you know, yeah, you know, when I started it, I was like, OK, I understand this is fiction. And they're like, but at some point I stopped thinking that. And they're like, and I don't think I forgot it. I think I was just convinced. And I'm like, well, that was kind of the point of the photographs being at the end of every chapter is I wanted them to build on each other. And I wanted you, you know, they start pretty mundane. You see the library, you see the house I grew up in. But you're also getting a visual of things that that you know, are real places because they're in these photographs. So by the time you start seeing crime scenes and faces of the victims smiling, you know, alive and well, it, you know, my hope was, yeah, that it, they would just kind of, you know, stack on top of each other to, to be a convincing, you know, argument that eh, you're reading something that's, that's not just fiction. You seem to have like a penchant for um, almost like urban legends, or I, I should say more like rural legends would mm -hmm. be a better way to put it. Uh, even, I mean, going all the way back to the beginning of our conversation with the Washingtonians in a way, um, you, you're, you're, I don't know, a myth maker. In this yeah, way. you know, and, and the best way to, 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 to uh, the, the best reasoning behind that is, is me just admitting that I am, I'm a believer, you know, I am, uh, I would be with spooky Mulder. I'd be like, you don't have to try to convince me to believe dude. Cause I believe. Um, and I was the kid who growing up, you know, who was like, you know, we're going to grow up, we're going to go on a Bigfoot expedition. <laughs> and like I talk about in the book, you know, I was surrounded by these military bases, top secret installations with big fences and, you know, um, you know, warehouses built underground. And I mean, all this stuff existed. So yeah, of course we believe they were like, you know, they weren't just doing weapon testing and, 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 you know, uh, chemical testing, which is what they were really known for. Well, of course they have UFOs and, 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 uh, you know, aliens that they're, you know, dissecting and stuff. So yeah, I've always been that guy. And, and, and I remember I, I read an introduction to one of King's books where he said he, uh, you know, he's like, he was always the kid who believed that if you did some, whatever to a golf ball, it would explode and you did this. And I'm like, no wonder we get along so well, because I was that kid too. We would have both been, you know, scared to death of half of these things and fascinated by the others. But yeah, so, so myths and local legends. Um, and that's what I love about small towns too, is every town has at least one, usually three or four. Um, but now you're creating new ones. <laughs> yeah, no, I love it. That's, that's, that's probably, you know, one of the, uh, most satisfying things in my job, you know, I mean, I'll, it, I'll never forget it. You know, I have two sons um, for, for quite a few years and, and they're born in the beginning of November. They would have their a joint birthday party at a corn maze um, and we'd have a big bonfire and we would do the corn maze. And, and then I would always end up telling them and their friends, you know, scary stories around, around the uh, bonfire. And the one year I made up this guy, the stick man, who was this legend made of corn stalks. And he took little children who, you know, strayed from the main groups and blah, 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 blah. And I just remember 
at some point I'm telling the story and, and I'm looking at these kids and their eyes are like this big because they're, they're, I mean, they're scared, but they're also captivated. And it was just funny because when we got to the corn maze, we were talking about trick or treating costumes. And my, my oldest son, Billy is like, well, I got, you know, I want to be this, I want to be that. And later that night walking to the car, he's like, it, it, it was just cute because he was so, uh, he was so enamored with, with his dad telling these scary stories. He's like, dad, I think I'm going to be you for Halloween. And I was just like, that's what I'm, I'm like, there you go. What could be better than creating your own legends? And then, you know, having your, your eight year old son looking up to you saying, I want to trick or treat as you dad. So I feel like one day you're going to be uh, you're going to be John Houseman at the beginning of the fog. <laughs> <laughs> that's what, that's what you're turning into. <laughs> yeah. uh, no, that'd be the, trust me, that would be uh, that'd be heaven for me. You know, uh, just old fashioned storyteller. You know, that's that's what I always tell people. I'm like, look, I'm not, you know, and and Boogeyman is proof of that. You know, I am not this master stylist who is going to dazzle you with language. Um, You know, I am one of those writers who, who, you know, works hard at it, but it's deceptively, you know, simple prose. And it's just because I'm I'm trying to tell a story and I'm trying to take you to a different place in time. And uh, you're not going to stop too often in my books and say, I need to look this word up or, you know, those kind of things. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. Like being the, like what you said, you know, put me in the beginning of the, of the fog, you know, kind of uh, getting ready to take you guys on a journey. And that's yeah, that's heaven for me. I know you said you don't have interest in writing, a, writing a script or something, but maybe like in terms of like your own like persona that you, you're you're cultivating here around this i feel like maybe if there is a film of chasing the boogeyman maybe that's the way it begins right you around a campfire you walking down the path telling the telling the ghost story i don't know well it's funny because my son and i have made some short films together and we've had a lot of fun doing it and and that is kind of uh you know it's it's kind of been uh, reinvigorating for me you know you you know we're doing them all ourselves. So there's nothing's by committee. It's just us. And, and that's been fun. And, and one of them, you know, we, we collaborated on it. We, Stephen King and I came up with this idea for this little short called trapped. And um, cause I kept, I sent him the first two short films that Billy and I did. And I said, one of these days you and I should do one. So we, we wrote an outline together. Um, and then Billy and I wrote this, actually I wrote the script, a short script and Billy directed it. And this happened right before COVID. So it got accepted into all these festivals that never happened. Um, I think maybe a half dozen of them happened online, but it ended up being good for us because we, we, we showed the film to a director out in Los Angeles and he's like, let's do a feature of this. Let's do the script. He's worked with Stephen King before. His name is Mark Pavia. He did uh, the night flyer with Steve. So uh, Billy and I and and Mark wrote a a feature adaptation and uh, he's going to direct it. So yeah, I don't have to do anything else. I'm out of it. I'm not. <laughs> he, Mark's like, you guys have got to come to set. I'm like, I'll come for a few days and that's it. I'm, I've got too much work to do at home. Um, let me ask you a question I, I like to ask uh, authors in general, because one thing we've discussed over the past year is what is horror even and where do you see yourself in relationship to it as, as a genre? Like, we talk about like, you know, thriller, dark fantasy, dark fiction, all these different pockets of horror. Like where, where do you f- feel like it lives and where do you see your work in relationship to the genre? Um, you know, I'm pretty, I'm, I'm, you know, I think you kind of already touched on it and that, you know, I, and, and I, I put the word storyteller to it and I added old fashioned, which for some people will, you know, they'll be like gagging and other people will be like, yeah, I like that kind of storytelling. Um, and I've, I've said that about myself all along, because in 1988 and, and in the early 90s, there was a big back and forth between between graphic and quiet horror. It's back when Splatterpunk and, you know, Skip Inspector and David Scow and Ray Garten and a lot of the other R.C. Matheson. And they were kind of butting heads with the Charlie Grants of the world, um, you know, who, who was a great, you know, writer of, of quiet atmosphere car. Um, and. I, people always just say, well, you know, where are you at? And I'm just like, man, I just like a good story. I tend to be on, on, on the more traditional side because that's what I grew up with. And that's, that's what brings me the most enjoyment. And since I'm, I'm the dummy paying these, you know, my own bills and not making any money, I'm going to publish what I like. <laughs> and, and that's also what I mainly what I wrote. But so, so for me, you know, I fall re- very much on that traditional side of, of horror, um, and, uh, you know, I've always known that I that I could write, 
you know, some people, you know, their, their prose is too dense or their plotting is, is just absolutely too complex to ever even have a shot at writing like a, a mainstream thriller, that kind of thing. And, and I've always known that I have that potential. And, and some of it's because I, I like to write in suburban settings so much. So I've had people say, you know, you remind me of Harlan Coben or you remind me of, you know, uh, you know, a Stephen King or a John Sanford without all the police procedural stuff. And I'm like, yeah, you know, that's that's me. I'm, I'm never going to pretend to be something I'm not, you know, and I, and I am pretty much just kind of, uh, you know, I'm I'm bordering on the mainstream with horror. You know, like you said, I like the fact you talked about myths and legends because. You know, that stuff that that stuff makes me happy and, and, and energizes me because there's so much to do with it. You know, and that's why I love the X-Files is because especially in those, those opening seasons, that's what they were all about. I, it's interesting because in the book and obviously just looking at the background behind you, you're a bookish guy. You're oh, a gosh, consumer yeah. of what you do. And you, you, you it's kind of like um, just a really brief mention in Chasing the Bookie Man about how bookish you kind of were. Uh, growing up and I'm just curious if you could enumerate on more of what you were consuming apart from I, I remember like uh, Custer stories you you read but uh, oh that's funny yeah you remembered that I, um, I try I if you look yeah. behind me these are all the books I've read for this month uh, for, to get ready for everything um, that's just impressive that you remembered Custer because I'm like <laughs> I love when I get the I love when I get the question. Somebody's like, "Well, if you ever did a non-genre film and you had unlimited budget, what would you do?" And I, my stock answer is, and, and they always kind of look at back at me strangely. But I'm like, "Oh, I would just love to do a Custer movie, you know, about the love story between him and, and Libby, his wife." And they're just like, "What?" Um, but yeah, that's been around for a long time. I, you know, what I was one of five siblings, and so everybody read, you know, my, my dad was a big reader. He was, he was a big library guy. So we would go to the military library on post and also the Edgewood library. And he was big in the swap section. He was, you know, always reading, uh, you know, gold medal, a lot of spy books, which I had no interest in. Um, but the gold medal, the crime stuff I was interested, I, you know, that the covers kind of pulled me in. Um, my mom was a magazine reader. So, you know, I had no interest in reading her Reader's Digest or some of the other magazines she read. But, you know, you see your mom sitting in a chair reading all the time. Same thing with your sisters. And, you know, um, it, it becomes you, you, you know, it's kind of osmosis. You just take it in. And so I was reading anything I could get my hands on. Um, you know, I'd buy comics when I could. Um, uh, you know, like I said, I tag along with my father to the library. So I, I took out stacks of books. Um I remember pretending like I was sick a few days from school so I could stay home because we would, uh, my dad would always go to the library and pick out a stack of books for me to read in bed. Um, so yeah, I admitted that to them many years later. I'm like, you know, that, that, that contributed to, uh, to my, uh, love of books, but yeah. And I, and I would read my sister's hand-me-downs. I would read Sidney Sheldon and Jackie Collins and anything. Jackie I could get, you Collins, know. Wow. I've always said, I'm a read the back of the cereal boxes kind of guy. Okay. You know, I, I'm much more likely to, 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 you know, to do that or to sneak the paper over to me and read the box scores in baseball or read the feature articles and, than I am, you know, to, to sit there and have a, a, a chipper conversation in the morning. So, yeah, I read anything and everything I could get my hands on. And uh, once I was old enough to, to earn my own money and once I was old enough to drive, um, you know, typical spoil kid instead of, you know, I still went to the library, but I, I very quickly started buying my own books. There was a Carol's used bookstore in Edgewood that I frequented all the time. And uh, yeah, I still have a lot of, but I have these spinner racks in my office and probably a third of the books up there still say Carol's used books inside the uh, front cover. So, I mean, in terms of, uh, you, you also mentioned uh, War of the Worlds uh, mm -hmm. as your, your movie uh, that you enjoyed very much when you were younger. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to like, sorry, crystallize a little bit more on when you decided that horror was the genre for you. I think it was, you know, I, I it was always there. My older brother, who was much older than me, um, so he wasn't in the household, but he would come. He was in the army, and he, when he would come home, he. I remember watching the those Abbott and Costello movies with him. You know, Abbott and Costello, oh, like, uh, Frankenstein, and the Frankenstein, the Mummy. You know, all those, and I remember being scared, but also laughing. Um, 
but it, the, for me, it was just, it was, it was a natural attraction. I mean, it, you know, Wizard of Oz, big event television back then came on once a year. Mm-hmm. You know, it was the flying monkeys and the trees, the haunted forest that I loved. And, and I was terrified. I would hide behind the chair, you know, chitty, chitty, bang, bang. It was the child snatcher with his snatcher with his, uh, his net. And, and we were a big, you know, I, I, we would watch television as a family, you know. Um, so I remember watching movies like uh, Tarantula. And thinking, okay, I, I need to pay attention because when I grow up, I'm going to have to fight giant tarantulas at some point. Um, the birds, you know, Alfred Hitchcock, that was on the other night. And, I, and it struck me. I'm like, I bet I watched this, you know, half a dozen times by the time I was 10, you know. Um, it's funny that you said it because like uh, as a kid, you also think from cartoons that quicksand is going to be a much bigger problem. As I an was adult. just going to say, you know, <laughs> not only giant tarantulas, but quicksand, uh, Bigfoot. I was convinced that, you know, I was going to be a major Bigfoot, you know, expedition leader and, you know, all these things. I somehow I, you know, I was convinced I was also going to be a member of the 7th Cavalry that, you know, that was still wore blue <laughs> uniforms and rode horses. So I just always had the big imagination. And I was always attracted to the stuff that was exhilarating and scary. And the th- I started writing stories when I was probably seven or eight, and they were always monster stories or war stories. And um, then I just, you know, kind of fell into the normal, you know, you're growing up and you're more interested in playing baseball and girls. And, and then in 10th grade, my, my English teacher brought in a photocopy of The Monkey by Stephen King. And we read this aloud and cl- we took turns reading aloud in class. And I remember... I remember at first everyone's giggling because there were cuss words in there. And, you know, I know the section I read, I actually got to read out, out loud fart. Um, and, you know, so I'm giggling because, you know, I'm 15, you know, I'm surrounded by, by, by girls, you know, half of, you know, I want to date probably. And it's just all fun. But I remember by the end of this story, the entire classroom was quiet. And it was kind of like the, what I described telling those stories to the kids at the bonfire. We were all just captivated. And that was the first time I, th- I, I legitimately thought to myself, I want to do this. I want to mm-hmm. take people and, and transport them the way that I just was transported. And, and then again, because I'm not very bright and because I'm young, you know, I'm back to playing lacrosse and girls and parties. And then it was my, uh, junior year in college and I got hurt. I was on a lacrosse scholarship and I got hurt and I, and I, you know, I was kind of lost and it by Stephen King was out in hardcover. And I remember I saw a big stack of these books in the bookstore and I bought one and I went back to my apartment on campus. And for the next two weeks, I just, I read and disappeared into dairy. And by the time I was finished with that, I was like, okay, I'm reminded of what I'm supposed to do. And two weeks later, I was writing for the school newspaper. Probably two months after that, I was submitting my first short stories to to different markets. And probably six months after that is when I started the magazine. So uh, when I say it changed my life, uh, it's not, you know, cliche or uh, me being overly dramatic. It's like I read that book and it reminded me of of, of exactly what I was supposed to do. So fair enough. Um, in terms of, uh, I, I guess then, like with the monkey, or is it is, is there um, a specific story that you do return to now, with some distance and a lot more experience? Um, you mean uh, other writers' works, right? Well, just something that yeah. sort of continues to rekindle this fuel. Well, you know what? It, it I've read it probably five or six times, but that's the thing. I can go back and read you know, people always talk about how you go back and they read things and they see it through more experienced eyes. And, and, you know, it's, it's, it's much lesser uh, of, uh, of an experience for them. And that's happened to me a handful of times, but not to any of the big ones. You know, I remember the first time I read Salem's Lot and I can go back and it's interesting because my, my oldest son tried to read Salem's Lot when he was about 18 and, and I, he didn't want to say it to me. He didn't want to say, dad, it's kind of slow in the beginning. And, and he put it down and moved on to something else. Now he read it again about six months ago and he was just captivated by it and terrified of it. And he would text me. He was, he was living here because he had just graduated and he was texting me from like, you know, out by the pond, different scenes from the book. And I'm actually rereading it right now because I'm, I'm like, I'm so jealous of you reading this for the first time. But yeah, there's, you know, Boy's Life by Rick McCammon. You know, I still go back and reread, uh, um, you know, Lord of the Flies. Um, 
And, and a lot of, you know, nonfiction, I'll go back and read a lot of history books that I read as a teenager, just because they did the same thing that fiction did is that they took me, you know, they kind of put me in a time machine and took me somewhere else. Um, so, yeah, but for me, it will always kind of hold that that special magic for me. And I actually had reread it shortly before I had uh, started writing Chasing the Boogeyman. So I know some of that sense kind of trickled in there. Is there a true crime story that you return to as well, considering you're appropriating the genre? Um, you know, there's only a tr- I've read a lot of true crime and I'm looking at a stack over there on that bookshelf. Um, the one that that only a few have I reread and the one, you know, the stranger beside me, you know, I think that's the title, the Anne yep. rule one with Ted Bundy that for a while, that was my pat answer. When, when interviewers would ask me, what's the scariest book you've ever read? And I would say that because it gave me nightmares and because it was all real and just that dynamic of that relationship and the things that he did. And I, you know, when I read that he beat those uh, sorority girls with, with pieces of kindling, you know, firewood that he found outside the sorority house, I, I dreamt about that and could not shake that for months. Um, so that's probably the go-to for me. Sure. Um, but uh, I, I've probably read it three times, but I, I think I'm done. I was like, I don't, I don't need to read it anymore. It's, it's got like etched into the mind. Now you can. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, and it's one of those stories where I read it and I'm thinking to myself, is this really real? Did, can this be, you know, the nature of their relationship and and the proximity and how they became friends and, and all of that. I'm like, did she just write this to sell the book? And then of course I'm like, no, this really happened. You know, there's all this documentation and, you know, she sold this as a, as a work of nonfiction. So of course, but yeah, it was just hard to, to even fathom that story being true. And, and, Um, And again, it showed to me, it really, it really shined a spotlight on exactly how just insidious those human monsters are because, you know, it's kind of cliche to say they could be anywhere there. They could be your next door neighbors and all that, but it's like, that's always been the scariest thing for me. You know, again, I get that, you know, what's the scariest monster for you? And I'm like the human monster. It's, it's half of what I write about. Um, and it's because from a very early age, I did recognize that they could live next door. That's always got, it's me. I, I use the film, uh, the, the vanishing or spore loose a yeah. lot and just you know most of that movie is a car ride <laughs> yeah and it, it but how easily the, i mean how many times has that happened you know and we yeah. don't even know about it and how easy is that i mean you talk about just a a, a crime of such convenience and and uh yeah i mean yeah sends a shiver down my spine just thinking about it but yeah, that's that's the thing. And I, me- I remember a review, Ed Bryant at Locust did a review of my first collection and was very kind to it. But I remember a line he did say that he's like, you know, Rich doesn't quite buy into the supernatural yet. He, uh, you know, his work is so focused on that, you know, crimes of humanity. And I'm like, you know what, you're the only reviewer who has said that. And you're right. You know, at that time, in my late 20s and, and early 30s, I had a hard time writing about vampires and, and, you know, monsters like, you know, the, the supernatural monsters like that. It was, it, it, I, it was much more authentic when I was writing about human monsters because I believed in it. I mean, they are everywhere, as you say. Um, yeah. So let me ask you some uh, more uh, quick rapid fire questions here sure. at, the, at the end of our uh, discussion uh, time. Let's, um, what, what's next for you is a, a general one I like to know in terms of like, what is there a future for chasing the boogeyman? I know obviously you're promoting it right now. It just came out yeah. uh, in the last um, month. I have an idea for a sequel, which wasn't even thought of or planned when I started or finished the book. Um, but recently, and, and not because people have been asking for it or anything like that. I just, but recently I thought I, I kind of just, the let's just say this, the first chapter of a sequel came to me that ends with, you know, a, a great, you know, kind of just punch to the gut um, that is very connected to the first book. So I thought, you know, I, all I could envision is the trade paperback of Chasing the Boogie Man coming out with that first chapter um, of the sequel being included as a bonus section. And that alone made me want to write it. So I, I think that's probably what I'm going to write next again with the idea that I don't know if Simon Schuster will want it. They might want me to go write, you know, some suburban thriller, but this is what I want to write. So I'm going to write it and we'll see what happens. And you have another Gwendy book coming out? Yeah, February, um, Cemetery Dance is publishing Gwendy's final task in hardcover. And then Gallery will publish it in trade paperback uh, over the summer. So a pretty quick, 
pretty quick turnaround there, but uh, we're excited. It's a full length novel, unlike the first two. And Steve and I wrote it together. And uh, I was just telling my wife earlier today, I'm like, the exciting thing is, is, you know, it, it, I, it's not just that I have a book coming out with Stephen King in February, but it's a really good one. You know, I'm, I'm excited because I think people are going to like it. And, and I'm not that writer. I see writers all the time and say, this is going to blow you away. And I'm like, you know, I, I respect and admire your confidence, but when it comes to my own work, you've never heard me say that. I'm not saying that about this book, but I am saying, you know what? I think people are going to like it because it's a good story. Okay. I mean, that seems to be what you're all about too, is the good story. Yeah. And, but it's just, I always, I always look at writers like that. I'm like, right on, man. If like, we're going to play picket basketball, I'm that guy. I'm like, you know what? You better bring your A game because you're going to have a long day. But when it comes to writing, I'm like, no, hell, I don't know if you'll like it or not. I like it. So that's enough, but yeah. What are you reading right now? What am I reading? Well, I'm rereading Salem's Lot. Right. Salem's Lot. Uh, Anything new? um, I just started a book called Rovers about uh, about these vampires, um, which has been recommended to me by a bunch of people. And uh, I was like, finally, I'm like, all right, fine. I'll pick up a copy and read it. I, you know, the last time I've heard this many people talk about a, a book was. Uh, uh, what is the last house on Needless Street? I think it was called. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Really good book. Yeah, I read that one, but I had never heard that kind of buzz about a book. Um, so I was like, I finally got to get a copy of this. Uh, I'll look at it. Vampire is reading a, 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 a renaissance right now, I feel like. Yeah. And, and it's like, again, if I try to write a vampire book, it would suck. <laughs> Literally, well, there you go. <laughs> yeah. I didn't even do that on purpose. Um, we talked a lot about books, obviously, because you're an author. Uh, I am curious. It is the spooky season. Uh, are you watching any spooky media? I just, well, we're watching, my son and I are watching uh, Midnight Mass. We okay. just finished the fourth episode last night, which we kind of our our jaws have dropped several times in that series. I don't know if you've seen it or not yet, but they're, they're, it, it's got quite a few like significant surprises. That and one of which I think it was episode three. We looked at each other and we're like, "I have never read that or seen that on a movie screen ever." And uh, so that that was interesting. Um, and then I watched on Netflix. Uh, I think it was called. Uh, it was based on Adam uh, Neville, a British writer. Um, and I think it was called No One Gets Out Alive, something like that. Okay. Um, I think it's the number one movie on Netflix right now, but I watched that yesterday and it disturbed the hell out of me. So <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm the guy, like I love October because, you know, my wife will come in and roll her eyes because she hears the Halloween music for the eighth time of the month. But it's like, I can't change it. There's certain movies that, you know, they come on and I'm like, I'm stuck. And Halloween is one of them, you know. Um, sure. but I love the fact that in Halloween, you know, all the films are on every night, you know, on like six different channels. So you can find something, you know, well, everybody's competing with them, each other this year with like these curated, mm-hmm. uh, like months of, of Halloween movies and things. And it really like, does start on the first. That's yeah. the exciting thing. Like it, in, in, in past days, it didn't really kick into gear until like the middle of October. Um, no, you're, you're now, right. I mean, even the stuff in stores, like. Uh, the end of August, like pumpkins, like live pumpkins were being sold. I'm like, that's never going to make it to Halloween. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You're going to have a, a squishy little thing on your porch. But yeah, no, I, uh, I, October is my favorite month. I, uh, I've always been that guy, even when I was young, you know, I'm like, I, I am, I feel more alive in the autumn and, uh, and, and I'm a summer guy. I love, you know, fishing and being outdoors and I love snow. So it's kind of like, I, you know, I wouldn't want to live somewhere that doesn't have the four seasons, but autumn is it for me. I think I write better in the fall. Mm. Uh, last question I want to ask you is a, a question I like to ask all my guests, which is, can you tell me a, uh, a horror blasphemy, uh, either something that you really like that is generally unpopular uh, or the reverse of that, something that you dislike that is very popular? Um, well, it's hard as you know what I, I'm a I'm an easy uh, I'm an e- I am an I disliked the the torture stuff the the torture horror stuff when it was hot like uh, and like I'm good for Saul. yeah you know what I just I, I was like no nah, you know not for me and 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 I did after way after the fact I did watch the first Hostel and I'm like okay I get it I get why this one you know, was, was popular and I get why this one you know some people said it was smarter than than at first view. Um, but yeah, like this, you know, the first saw same thing. I actually really liked it uh, upon further viewing, but yeah, that's just, it's always kind of been a turnoff for me. And, uh, 
you know, I, uh, I've, I had that argument with a lot of people trying to convince me to watch certain things. And I was just like, no, I'm good. And they're like, oh, you're like an old man. I'm like, that's okay. <laughs> but yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty easy. I, I'm a pretty easy uh, horror consumer usually. So th- there's not too much of that blasphemy in me. All right. Well, thank you very much for spending some time with us. Uh, oh, my pleasure. Evening. And thank you all for tuning in. Tune in tomorrow night for Dr. William McBride. And as always... Stay spooky. Thanks, guys. Thank you again for uh, coming on and talking with me. I really oh, my pleasure. That was that was fun. I appreciate uh, it. And if, if I can do anything to help you in the future, just let me know. Definitely. I, I, I hope I uh, I found some questions you haven't. Hey, good. Asked. Yeah, no, that was fun. That was definitely different than usual. And, uh, you know, I, I think it kind of looked at different parts of the books than, than most foot posts looked at. So I like that. And I think they will, too. Good. I, I, it, it's always a challenge with uh, people are hot, you know, like to find the, uh, right, to find your own way in. Yeah, no, I, you did really well, and it was all very natural and, and fun. So thank you. Uh, my, my, my deep pleasure. Um, so yeah, uh, I, I'm, I'm really anxious to watch these little videos you're making, though. I'm, I'm, I'm really curious about it because I, I, I enjoyed it too today when I discovered it on your uh, Twitter. Yeah, I mean, you're talking about like guerrilla filmmaking. He's filming, yeah. me on, you know, instead of bringing a camera, he's doing it on his, on his iPhone and, uh, you know, just doing it completely through the phone. But uh, we ha- we were in a hurry. But uh, yeah, we have some cool ideas. Like one of where I said, I told him today, I said, Billy, we got to do a couple of these at night to add atmosphere. And and I've been posting pictures of of uh, the boogeyman in the mask also the last two nights. I, I saw like, that too. Yeah, and and it's I got a great response. I, I told my son, I'm like, ah, I think we'll put them up there and we'll get a few comments, and that's fine, you know. But hopefully, it'll kind of spark other people to doing it because I think it'd be fun, and I want to give away some cool prizes. Uh, but we've gotten great responses, and Billy's like, Dad, one of the ones you do at night, I'm going to be standing in the distance in the mask. And we'll see if anyone notices. It won't be real, uh, you know, obvious. So we're gonna have fun with it. That's yeah, and that's the big that's the big thing for me. Is it's like 